रामाय राम भद्राय रामचंद्राय वेद से रघुनाथाय नाथाय सीताय प्रति ए नम सुंदरकांड चैप्टर नंबर नाइन द हेरन द रेसिटेशन बिगिन्स नाउ and in the center of that car maruti came upon a rare palace it was the residence of ravana its length was one full yojana and it was half yojana broad it was adorned with many a tower and a turret and a terrace maruti sought for janaki of matchless beauty all over the palace and passing through the lovely mansions of the rakshasas reached the palace of ravana himself Lofty elephants of the noblest breed stood at the gates with three and four tusks. Armed guards patrolled around it at regular intervals. They were the sleeping apartments of the queens of Ravana and of the princess who were torn from the homes and the arms of innumerable kings who went down before Ravana in his hour of conquest around the worlds. That abode of the Rakshasa Lord reminded one of the great seas teeming with sharks, whales, leviathans and other huge monsters of the deep, ever vexed with storms that tossed the billows aloft like huge mountains. It was filled with Rakshasas of frightful shape and blinding splendor. The palace of Ravana was a concentration of the wealth and magnificence of Kubera, the Lord of Riches. and indra the ruler of the gods and the blinding radiance of garuda the thrice fortunate bearer of the great father lord vishnu in the houses of the rakshasas that dwelt in lanka you can feast your eyes upon everything rare and priceless that the palaces of kubera yama varuna and the other regions of the world held nay even upon the objects that were foreign to them In the far past, Vishwakarma fashioned it in the world of the gods for the use of Brahma. Later on, Kubera won the heart of his grandsire by his stern tapas and devotion, and obtained it as a reward. Lastly, Ravana defeated in battle his older brother Kubera and wrested it from him as the prize of valor. Statues of wolves were sculpted on the pillars, curiously fashioned with gold and silver. The car shone as it were in its splendor. Its crest was lost in the sky, even like the mountains Meru and Mandara. Tiny pavilions, lodges, and kiosks of auspicious shapes were skillfully hid from view here and there. The aerial car reduced to pale insignificance the radiance of the Lord of Day and Fire. This was the masterpiece in every way of countless creations of Vishwakarma. Lofty terraces with staircases of gold, windows of crystal gold and other rare materials, large gateways, platforms inlaid with emeralds and other rare gems, floors adorned with intricate mosaics of coral, priceless pearls and matchless diamonds, sandal paste of rare perfume and red like the morning sun. The car pushpaka dazzled the eyes with the blinding splendor of the Lord of Day as he came out through the gates of the rising mountain. And Anjaneya went up into it, intent upon his search for Mother Sita. The sweet fragrance that arose from the dining salons, rich with rare foods, drinks and other refreshments, was borne by joyful breeze far and wide. Anjaneya passed through the portals of the lofty car even as a lord of air in his visit to the lord of mortals like the pleasant welcome that his dear kinsman extend to one of them who returns after a long sojourn in far away lands the fragrance that was borne from the dining halls of ravana seemed to invite anjaneya to pay a visit to the refectory and anjaneya guided by it beheld the wonderful dining salons of ravana it was dear to the heart of the rakshasa king even like his favorite queens the steps and stairs were inlaid with precious stones yet other spots were ornamented with crystal and ivory yet other places were adorned with pillars and columns inlaid with gold and silver 
Yet other lofty pillars covered with curious designs and fretwork were planed smooth and gave one the idea that the car pushpaka spread its wings aloft for an aerial flight. The floor was covered with thick and priceless carpets on which were worked the globe with its mountains, rivers, valleys, meadows, forests, towns and villages. So one could be excused for believing that the car was a miniature of the dominions ruled over by the kings and emperors on earth. Birds of rare hue and plumage called to one another gaily in the exuberance of their spirits. Sandal, aloes, rose water, saffron and other rare scents assailed the senses in a most pleasant way. Priceless seats covered with more priceless covers were scattered about. Here and there, he came upon places that were blackened with the smoke of aloes. Yet other places were spotlessly white like lordly swans. Flowers of every hue and shape covered the floor everywhere. Like the faultless Kamadenu, the divine cow of Vashishta, that car left nothing to be desired. It permeated one's innermost self with boundless joy. It chased away the gloom and sorrow. It brought radiance and brightness to a man's presence and placed within his reach every kind of wealth and luxury. It afforded to the senses their dearest delights and looked after one with motherly care and love. Anjaniya feasted his eyes with its wonders and cried in admiration. Is this the mansion of the great gods which one reaches by the merits of performing of the Vedic rites? Or is it the very world of Brahma himself that great souls attain to after countless ages of stern tapas? And he stood there utterly dazed and in pleasant confusion. Columns of gold rose aloft, lighted by lamps of precious stones with spotless wicks and crystal oil. The light was so pleasant to the eye, so steady and motionless, reminded him of the gambling salons where greenhorns, fleeced bare by veterans, were planning deeply about asking their revenge and recovering their losses. Countless lamps chased away gloom and darkness and made it bright as day. The natural radiance and glory that played about the form of Ravana, whose fame extended to the uttermost confines of the worlds, and struck down terror into the hearts of everyone upon whose ears fell that dread name, though he was no whit behind in stern tapas, deep erudition, perfect knowledge of the Vedas and Vedantas and faultless performance of the duties of his caste and order. The brilliance of the ornaments that graze the forms of his women. All these extorted from Hanuman the exclamation and doubt. This car verily is on flames. On priceless carpets and rugs spread on the floor, there reclined many a lovely maiden of faultless perfection, dressed in gay and beautiful colors and garlands of curious workmanship. They fancied various styles and guises, and weary and fatigued with having enjoyed themselves with their lord, fell under the potent influence of drink. The tingle of ornaments that filled the harem during the day with sweet music was conspicuously silent at midnight when its inhabitants lay in deep sleep. And Marathi was surprised into exclaiming, Is this a deep pool lovely at night with sleeping swans and the bees that cluster over them? Those ladies were clasped in the arms of sleep with lips closed firmly, hiding from view the rows of pearly teeth and the long and curved eyelashes lightly resting on the lids, while the sweet fragrance of their breath filled the place like the odor of blown lotuses. Even as lovely lotuses that are roused to consciousness by the sweet touch of the Lord of the day, and having filled the world with delight, sink into deep sleep with their petal eyes gently closed when the Lord and lover has gone away from them beyond the setting mountains, 
Those noble dames rose before their lord in the morning and waited for the first glance of love and affection to fall upon them from their lord. And having spent the day in a sweet company, they sink into deep sleep of exhaustion after him. The garments were in sweet disorder during deep sleep, and Anjanea, though he was privileged to behold them in their privacy, was in no way disturbed in his serenity. His heart was pure and unsullied as ever. Nay, his splendor and brilliance even increased apace. Said to himself, these patterns of perfect womanhood remind me in their lovely faces of lotuses in a calm pool in the beauty, hue and fragrance that charm the senses. I have not the slightest doubt that the bees intoxicated with too frequent draughts of honey will mistake them for blown flowers and pay frequent visits to them. Like the clear blue vaults of the autumnal sky paved with stars shown that harem of Ravana, filled with those matchless women in deep sleep, with their limbs flashing like lightning and their faces crowned with black sweet curls like the dark clouds on the horizon. And Ravana, sleeping among them, resembled the full moon in all her splendor in the midst of the countless stars. Anjanea was struck dumb with wonder at the sight of those ladies of Ravana who appeared to him like the just and righteous souls who, having attained through their matchless merit to the height of the rulers of the star worlds, wane after countless eternities in their splendor and fall upon the earth through the strength of the slight remnant of spiritual greatness that yet remain to them. Like the great star clusters of auspicious radiance, those ladies irradiated the space around with their beauty, splendor, and glory. Their garland of flowers and necklaces of gems were in sweet disorder through too frequent potations, gay sports, and sweet dalliance with their lord. Their ornaments were displaced largely. Fatigue overcame them, their faces gradually lost their freshness, and they slept the sleep of the just and the innocent. The tilaka that adorned the foreheads of some noble dames were no longer there. The anklets of yet others slipped away. The strings of pearls that adorned others lay by their side. Overcome with the exhaustion that follows indulgence overmuch in the delights of love, those girls lay in deep unconsciousness with their necklaces and waistbands broken and their garments loose. And they resembled mares who, having gone through a very long course, rolled over and over on the ground to throw off their weariness and fatigue. Some were adorned with beautiful earrings. The garlands of others were faded and broken. Disporting themselves with Ravana of mighty arms, they looked like the lovely creepers, flower-clad, trampled under the feet of maddened elephants. The ropes of pearls that shone like the sun and the moon between the breasts of some resembled lordly swans on a pool. The strings of emeralds that graced the shoulders of others deluded one into the belief that they were swans and the golden cord that held gems together were rows of chakravakas. The hips of those ladies were very much like the mounds of sand around the clear crystal waters of the autumnal streams. The garlands were the swans that sailed over them. Their swelling breasts were the chakravakas. Their eyes were the dark lilies. Their lips were the tender shoots. Their feet were the lotuses. Their necks were the shells. Their eyes were the fish that darted here and there. And their navels were the sailing eddies. The splendor of their bodies that proclaimed them as a perfection of their sect was the banks. Their gay acts of dalliance were the crocodiles, their ornaments were the blown lotuses, and their tinkling anklets were the buds. The priceless ornaments that graze the soft limbs and breasts of some resemble the lovers that would not have departed from the mistresses even during sleep. The garments of some rested their fringes on the faces of their owners, whose breath lightly disturbed them now and then. And as they rose and fell, they looked like creepers of varied hues. 
the sweet fragrant breath of some of the sleeping beauties there stirred their earrings lightly. It needs no saying that their breath was ever sweet, and it was rendered yet more sweet and fragrant through the honey mixed with sugar as it blew gently upon Ravana. Others were sunk in utter unconsciousness through drink and sleep, and naturally mistook the faces of their friends that lay by them for that of their beloved Lord Ravana, and kissed it often and often in the strength of their passion. And those thus kissed mistook her for their Lord through their deep love for him, and they returned it with tenfold ardor. Thus, through the strength of their love to Ravana, those ladies delighted themselves with one another through sweet music. Some slept there with no pillows, but their arms grazed with ornaments. Others made a pillow of their wraps. One of them lay with her head on the breast of another through drink and deep attachment. And another slept with her head laid on the shoulders of the former. There lay a gentle lady with her head resting on the lap of a friend, and on her shoulders lay the heads of two others in the sleep of weariness. Their thighs, sides, hips, loins, and other limbs were in inextricable confusion. It gave one the idea of countless garlands of flowers, their shapely arms, the string that ran through them, and their heads the lovely buds clustered with the sweet curls that lightly rested upon them even as intoxicated bees. That harem of the ladies of Ravana was even like a flower garden in spring. Their arms were the creepers, their shoulders were stalks, their fingers were the shoots, the clasps of their garment were the flower bunches, their black curling hair were the bees. Their sweet, fragrant breath was a southern breeze. And with their limbs thrown over others in the unconsciousness of sleep, they resembled countless creepers blown into a heap by the strong wind, and it was almost impossible for one to distinguish the limbs and the ornaments of each of them. The lights in the lamps of diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires glowed with a steady radiance on the columns of precious stones as if they were lovers stealthily gazing on with unwinking eyes at the ladies of Ravana in their graceful disorder of garments and ornaments under the influence of drink, fatigue, and sleep when he was in sweet slumber, since they could never even dream of doing it when he was awake. Among them, there were maidens from the homes of royal sages, the Pitris, Daityas, Gandharvas, and Rakshasa, who came to him of their own accord for very love. Others were won by him as the prize of victory over their kinsmen, who were laid low in the battle by the warlike Rakshasa king. Others were attracted to him by his beauty, splendor, wealth, and valor, and loved him with deep passion. But there were none who was bound to him only by ribbons of force and prowess, for each and every one of them lost their heart to him, except the Lady Janaki, the noblest gem on the crown of womanhood. Everyone there knew no other lover from their birth, no wife of another was to be found in the group. Nor was there in their midst anyone who was not of noble ancestry and came of the highest class of womanhood, the Padminis. Nor was there any among them one whom nature had not endowed with every auspicious mark and sign. Nor was there among them one whom ornaments and garments did not vie with one another to graze and adorn. Nor was there among them one who attended upon Ravana and did not meet his lightest wish with a most loving heart. Nor was there among them who was not his mate in health, strength, vigor, and hardihood. Nor was there anyone among them who did not find favor in his eyes. Hanuman of mighty intellect had the twist in his brain, probably through his subhuman nature, and said, Ravana committed the mistake of his life when he abducted the Lady Sita after Rama had made her his wife. He ought to have done it before, as he did with these countless maidens. Then danger and death will not hang over his head as they do now. 
मंगलम कोशलेन्द्राय महनीय गुणाते चक्रवर्ती धनुर्जाय सर्वभौमाय मंगलम